very happy to be part of this project. And I'd like to thank Professor Panos Mercouris and the European Research Council for being here today. And um, I'd like to just say um, a, few, a few words on the fact that I usually speak very fast, but because the purpose here is to elucidate and illuminate and not to confuse. If you feel like I'm speaking too fast, just yeah, raise your hand and I, I know. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, but I will tweak it a little bit because yesterday I got a question from um, a panelist from Mariana who asked me what is exactly this interpretation of customer international law. So um, I will first discuss what is interpretation of customer international law. And here uh, I'd like to point out that it very much depends the vantage point from which you are looking at interpretation of customer international law. So what we mean in the project is legal interpretation. Uh, this means that it should be distinguished both from other forms of interpretation, like semantic interpretation, uh, and also from interpretation of state practice, uh, something about which I will discuss further on. So whenever um, we hear the word interpretation, because uh, we are accustomed to believe that interpretation attaches to a reason text, then we, we really have a question, is interpretation related to written rules? And I'd like to use uh, the distinction made in 1839 by Francis Lieber between interpretation and construction to uh, give a little bit more understanding of what we mean by interpretation. So Lieber was, uh, was talking about the fact that interpretation indeed uh, tries to decode the meaning that exists within a legal text. However, there is also construction, which is different, which takes all these extra textual kind of elements. And for example, uh, with respect to treaty interpretation, we think about the object and purpose. And um, so this would be, according to Lieber, part of construction. And this distinction was also taken up in the Harvard Draft Convention on the Law of Treaties in 1930s. However, it was dismissed as irrelevant in the case of treaties. And so uh, under, sorry, uh, under the BCLT right now, it exists as a rule of interpretation, so um, in Article 31. But essentially, within itself, it comprises both interpretation, which relates to the meaning of a text, but also construction. So this is kind of the, the background that I'd like for you to, um, to keep in mind during my presentation. And now turning back to the life cycle of customer international law, um, I will briefly uh, discuss something that was also mentioned by Ricardo here. So the distinction between identification and interpretation. Um, so one of the panelists in the previous panel, uh, Dr. Castaneda, he mentioned that identification is both a law settlement process and content determination. And in a way, he kind of alluded that interpretation would not have a, a place within uh, these two binary constructions. I posit that identification is indeed um, a process of law ascertainment and content determination simultane sim simultaneously, sorry. But interpretation also is just another process of content determination. And here we should also distinguish between interpretation of state practice, which would fall under identification, um, not as interpretation, meaning legal interpretation as such. So um, state practice is qualified as being widespread, representative, consistent, and uniform, but is not as such interpreted. Um, and one other thing I would like to point out here, that sometimes interpretation or identification is just a matter of judicial choice. And here are two examples from international criminal law, Haji Hasanovic and uh, the Al-Bashir appeals that also Judge Van Gallagher mentioned yesterday. And the question there in both cases was whether a particular situation falls under an already existing customer rule of a more general character. And um, in Haji Hasanovic, this is, this is very, um, very visible because there, the majority of the judges, they considered that they need to identify a very particular customary rule 
to be able to apply it in the case. However, there were two dissenting opinions appended where the judges stated that it is sufficient to interpret the customary principle of command <coughs> responsibility to apply, um, to apply it to this case. So sometimes it may be a matter of how positivistic some judges may be uh, of whether they resort to identification or interpretation. And now I come to the core of my presentation, which essentially is kind of sharing my struggles with you. So um, I'm talking about how can we recognize interpretation of customer international law in the practice of international courts and tribunals. And it's, it is very nice to see that Ricardo referred to some cases, I referred to other cases, which demonstrate how pervasive the process of interpretation is in uh, international law, of customer international law, just to be clear. Uh, both of treaty law, of course, but uh, that's not uh, what I'm talking about today. So these are a few examples from the International Court of Justice where uh, customary international law was, uh, interpretation was explicitly acknowledged. And this is, uh, there's a quote from uh, the descent of Judge Bra in the Gulf of Maine case, while, uh, where he explicitly says, by interpreting customary international law. However, of course, not all of these cases are that straightforward, and sometimes we need to kind of excavate interpretation of customer international law from, from the practice of courts. Um, and here, the language used by the judges, and also the language of Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is very helpful. And for example, when, when judges talk about meaning of a rule, of a customary rule, or its scope of action, it already signifies that they are interpreting the customary rule because they do not uh, they do not check state practice. What is the practice? They do not search for opinion juris. They are taking the rule that exists and taking other relevant considerations, trying to determine whether the particular situation falls under this rule. Um, and also, so the rules, the language of the rules of treaty interpretation, the reference to object and purpose, or it's in to rationale, to the intention can also very much help in identifying these instances, regardless of the fact that custom and treaty are very different sources of uh, public international law. <coughs> and here I give uh, three examples, again, from international criminal law. Um, and I, I will uh, mention the last one first, because it's the most recent one. So in the uh, Taganda <coughs> decision um, on jurisdiction of the court in count six and nine, the ICC discussed the prohibition of rape and sexual slavery under Article 8 of the Rome Statute, but at the same time they acknowledged that they should analyze this prohibition in line of the existing framework of international law. And then they explicitly referred to general principles of international law and customer international law. And in this context, um, they analyzed whether the customary law prohibition on rape and sexual slavery can, um, can accommodate the situation when these acts are committed against one's own military forces. And it stated that uh, limiting the scope of protection in the manner proposed by the defense is contrary to the rationale of international humanitarian law. So this reference to rationale, to object and purpose, to understand how much can this rule, can this customary rule accommodate? Can it, does it provide for this particular situation? So again, um, as I previously mentioned, they did not go identifying state practice and opinion years, but rather referred to the rationale. And here I'd like to point out the fact that they referred to the rationale of international humanitarian law. So not of the rule as such, but to the whole branch of law. Whereas in treaty interpretation, usually it's about the object and purpose <coughs> of the treaty. Um, okay, and sometimes uh, even the rules that are explicit in the VCLT may be of no help. And then we should look at the rules that exist between the lines of the VCLT. And this is an example from the ICJ from the arrest warrant case, where um, the question was discussed whether the Minister of Foreign Affairs um, has immunity under customer international law. And um, again, the court did not go about identifying whether such a custom exists, 
but essentially compared the functions of the Minister for Foreign Affairs and that of head of state and heads of government, and concluded because the functions are so similar, essentially uh, we should acknowledge the fact that the Ministers of Foreign Affairs also have immunity under customer international law. So essentially, uh, the, the court resorted to a paranalogian kind of argument to rule on this case. Um, this does not include, exclude sorry, also that sometimes ambiguous situations may arise, where some scholars uh, also discuss whether it is interpretation or legal reasoning that's um, going on. And here, an example is the dissenting opinion of Judge Tanaka in the ICJ uh, North Sea Continental Shelf case. So um, Judge Tanaka acknowledges that he is engaging in interpretation of customer international law. However, a few paragraphs um, later, he also discusses the logical consequence and logical necessity of, um, of certain rules. And he, in the same context, he also refers to teleology and to the aims and purposes of the continental shelf as a legal institution. And this seems to confuse matters a bit because there is reference to a uh, kind of object and purpose, right, that we, uh, we know from treaty interpretation. But at the same time, his argument seems to um, to be constructed on um, and based on logic, so how we interpret the rule logically. And there's a, a scholar, Matthias Hardigan, who, for example, he disagrees <coughs> with uh, the fact that this is an instance of interpretation, but rather uh, just applying uh, logic to, to the case, so a form of legal reasoning. So this, uh, these are examples where we can, of course, debate and discuss. Uh, but this does not eliminate the situations where interpretation indeed happens, so even if we have such situations. And one last problem that I have identified so far is that sometimes customer international law interpretation is blended with treaty interpretation. And for example, in Haji Hasanovic, in the dissenting opinion of Judge Shahabuddin from 2003, so Judge Shahabuddin um, acknowledges that he uh, explicitly that he is interpreting customer international law, <coughs> But then um, he resorts to the Geneva Conventions and more particularly to the object and purpose of the provisions of this convention to interpret the customer rule. And this may create certain difficulties, so certain problems with um, an indirect applicability of the, or application of the treaty, for example. So um, whenever uh, judges engage in interpretation of customer international law, they of course should be mindful of the distinction between customer international law interpretation and treaty interpretation. And the fact that each of these rules may have um, a different content and a different rationale. And I think this wraps up uh, my presentation. And I was probably too fast. <laughs> but yeah, I hope um, that you can uh, take out from this presentation what interpretation of customary law is, at least in the understanding of this project, and what the difficulties in recognizing interpretation of customary international law in the practice of international courts and tribunals may be, and what are the means um, or the rules that we can resort to to help us in, uh, in this research and you know it when you see it. This is the last kind of conclusion. So this is my hope that um, applying this kind of guidelines you will know uh, when you see interpretation of customer international law. Thank you very much.